for the useful contributions to this debate, and I will, of course, consider uh, some of the points made and the suggestions made uh, between now and, and committee stage, and I look forward to having a fruitful committee stage next week. So thank you. Margaret much. Dara, um, I must now put the question that the bill be now read a second time. Chakti Thor, Hibli Kesh Jabajis Thor. Chakti Nagun Jabajis Neil. Shilin Gurun Kesh Richard. The division is postponed until immediately after the order of business on Tuesday, the 5th of March 2013, in accordance with the order of the Dáil of Thursday, the 28th of February 2013. The Dáil is adjourned until 2 p.m. on Tuesday, 5th of March 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, and having dealt with the procedural matters on our agenda, we can now turn our attention to the main themes for this discussion today. As chairs of finance and budgetary committees, we live in interesting times. The recent changes to economic governance in the European Union and the Euro era are welcome, and if I could just, in terms of welcome you here this morning, just say that it's Dublin Castle has been one of the premier venues in Dublin, I would hope will prove to be a very uh, hospitable and a very welcoming and very, very profitable uh, venue for this morning's meeting. So as chairs, the recent changes of economic governance in the European Union, the Euro era, our area, are welcome and very necessary developments. And in particular, the European semester, known as third year, the Council Agreement on a Single Supervisory Mechanism for Banks, the Fiscal Compact Treaty, agreement in the European Council on the MFF earlier this month, and the two-pack proposals for strengthened budgetary surveillance. These are highly significant developments which will greatly enhance the Europe, EU's ability to deal with economic challenges and the difficulties it faces. So we are dealing with the crisis, and the next phase is focused on driving recovery in Europe. In particular, we must ask ourselves, what is our overall vision for sustainable growth in Europe? From both an economic and social perspective, a key area that needs to be addressed is youth employment. It is in our national interest and the wider European interest that we create employment opportunities for our young people so that they too can become active citizens of the European Union. We cannot leave young people behind, we cannot leave them with no hope, and we must harness their energy. In a graveyard in the west of Ireland there's a headstone on it it says, you are where I once was, and I am where you will be. With the oil crisis of the 1970s and the economic crisis of the 1980s, we have been where the youth of today are now. And if we do not deliver sustainability, 
we will fail not alone to past generations, but almost certainly condemn future generations to economic and social turmoil. In the Irish language, there is a saying, Mullinoiga August Tuffy Shad, encourage youth and they will blossom. Today, in fixing the problems that we face in the European Union and the Eurozone, we need to better communicate and open a new European dialogue to fashion a European philosophy that is increasingly delivers a social dividend. And I believe that the time for that dialogue is now. And further, we as national parliamentarians are central to that. We only get one opportunity to make a first impression, and our duty, in the words of Julius Caesar, Capri Ding, is we must seize the day and change philosophy and give leadership to Europe in its current difficulties. As I said last evening, today's meeting takes place during what is a critical juncture for the European Union. Difficulty, but necessary steps taken towards fiscal consolidation in recent years have hit our citizens hard. While many technical elements designed to avoid a repeat of the financial crisis are now proposed, are, are now in place, we need to communicate the end result of this process. An overall vision for sustainable growth in Europe needs to be central to today's debate. We must begin to move beyond the language of consolidation and austerity and to the language of growth and prosperity. Europe must deliver. It's that simple. Europe must give hope. It must give direction and a roadmap for the future in a way that seeks to consolidate all that has been achieved by the European project to date. And it's no coincidence, or it's no small thing, that in winning the Nobel Peace Prize in Europe, it's that is as a result of the European project and the European model, and into the future, we must not rest upon that, we must now move forward from it. So in beginning today's meeting, I would like to acknowledge that it builds upon the excellent work undertaken by the Cypriot Presidency. I wish to congratulate my immediate predecessor, Mr. Nicholas Papadopoulos, for his initiatives under the Presidency of Cyprus. And I look forward to the debate with Minister Noonan and Commissioner Wren on the future revolution of economic and monetary union. In the second session, I look forward to hearing from Commissioner Lobanowski and Professor Carl Whelan as we debate supporting growth and reform, the EU financial framework up to 2020. And finally, I am particularly pleased that the Irish Presidency would include a focus upon parliamentary involvement in the European semester and to what both Minister Howland and Professor Mac Hallenberg have to say as we debate EU economic governance and the role of parliaments. It will be interesting to continue that dialogue on the role for parliaments in the creation of a real economic union, and I'm sure that will be reflected in some of the contributions we hear both this morning and this afternoon. I greatly value the opportunity to chair this meeting. I look forward to an interesting debate, and I hope that by conducting the proceedings in this opening fashion, we will provide the citizens we serve with a window into discussions and debates between European parliaments as we see greater economic stability and the European Union's economic recovery. Thank you. <laughs> well, to get proceedings formally underway, if I could call Commissioner Wren to the podium, please, to make your opening address. Commissioner. Good morning, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, Minister, dear, dear Michael, Honourable Chairs of uh, Finance and uh, Budgets Committees uh, of the National Parliaments uh, and uh, of the European Parliament, uh, dear friends, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to this uh, meeting of uh, chairpersons of uh, Finance Committees and Finance and uh, Budgets Committees. Uh, the theme of uh, today's discussion is uh, to look forward uh, as it should. Uh, however, seeing this meeting is taking place uh, here in uh, Ireland, uh, I first of all want to underline the great efforts uh, that have been taken in this country throughout uh, the crisis. Uh, thanks to the unforeseen measures uh, and uh, dedication of the Irish people, 
Ireland uh, will in the end of this year be able to exit uh, the program and uh, fully return uh, to market funding. The hard work is uh, paying off. Uh, and uh, you can see it also, you can see this also in the light of uh, the recent uh, deal on uh, the so called uh, promissory note. Uh, market conditions uh, for Irish bonds uh, have uh, steadily improved uh, with uh, confidence uh, growing. And uh, as I said, uh, Ireland is now on track uh, to exit uh, from the EU IMF program as uh, planned. Uh, in this context, uh, the major steps uh, taken by the Irish uh, authorities uh, regarding the promissory notes uh, should uh, further boost uh, confidence uh, and help uh, to facilitate uh, a successful outcome. And uh, as Michael and uh, the Irish government and uh, the parliament and I trust the Irish people know, the European Commission stands by Ireland uh, and uh, by the Irish people and uh, supports uh, them in this uh, very important uh, objective. As the debate on the future of uh, economic and monetary union should uh, not only focus on uh, institutional issues, uh, therefore uh, let me anchor it uh, into the real world, uh, or at least uh, into the real uh, economy. And let me give you an overview of uh, where we stand at the moment uh, in the European economy on the basis of uh, our very fresh forecast, uh, the winter economic forecast, uh, which was published uh, by the Commission only on Friday. It is uh, a dualistic picture of the European economy. We have uh, bad news, uh, we have uh, some better news. Uh, and uh, in any case, the forecast uh, shows uh, signs of uh, improving sentiments uh, Concerning uh, uh, confidence indicators, uh, we have a somewhat uh, better confidence, uh, somewhat better data from the confidence indicators uh, in the recent uh, two months or so, so that uh, both uh, the Commission's uh, economic uh, sentiment indicator is uh, improving since the end of uh, last year, and uh, so is the purchasing managers uh, index, uh, the composite uh, output. Uh, index uh, which are seen on this uh, graph. So you can in fact uh, see the deterioration of, uh, of confidence uh, somewhat less than a year ago when we had uh, the situation when Greece was heading to new elections. Uh, there was uh, plenty of uh, turmoil on Greece uh, and uh, the discussion on the breakup of uh, the percep perception on the breakup of the euro was at its uh, highest point uh, in spring and uh, summer of uh, last year. And it, ha it took its uh, toll on uh, investor and uh, consumer confidence uh, and it required uh, quite some efforts uh, by the Eurozone member states uh, as well as the European Central Bank uh, to turn this tide. Uh, and we are now coming, coming uh, from this, uh, uh, this uh, very difficult uh, period uh, towards uh, a somewhat improved uh, uh, period. Then uh, concerning uh, credit conditions, uh, we have a clear improvement uh, as regards uh, financial markets, especially sovereign bond markets, uh, which you can see on the left chart, uh, so that uh, we have uh, seen since, uh, in fact, uh, since the beginning of last year for some countries, uh, while uh, for some other countries, uh, since the beginning of uh, the decision of uh, the ECB's uh, outright monetary transactions, uh, we are seeing uh, an improvement uh, of uh, bond yields uh, or interest rates uh, of uh, government securities, uh, uh, which has uh, continued uh, up until uh, today. On the right chart, uh, on the right, right hand graph, uh, you can see that uh, the credit conditions uh, are still uh, rather uh, tight. Uh, in, uh, in the ECB bank lending survey, we can see that uh, there, is, uh, a, there has been a certain uh, easing, but uh, it has uh, it has remained uh, relatively stable and uh, we know that uh, there are extremely tight uh, lending conditions, uh, especially in the countries of uh, Southern Europe uh, for the moment. Uh, not only in Southern Europe, but also in some other parts of uh, Europe. And for instance, uh, in Spain, the real bottleneck uh, to growth uh, today is uh, the excessively tight uh, lending conditions, uh, which is a bottleneck uh, for the 
small and medium sized uh, enterprises. Uh, in a situation where the country's uh, exports have grown by 20% in the past uh, two years uh, and the export volume is uh, higher than ever, at the same time uh, we can see that uh, the credit conditions uh, are curtailing this uh, rebound uh, and uh, recovery of uh, export growth. At the same time, uh, the current uh, hard data is uh, or I would say was disappointing concerning the last quarter of uh, last year. The recession deepened uh, at the end of uh, last year compared to the previous quarter. GDP declined uh, by half percent uh, in the European Union. And uh, this is also carrying it over. This, this is carried over to this year, which means that uh, the starting point is, uh, is lower. And uh, therefore, this year we see overall zero growth uh, of uh, GDP in the European Union. Although this hides uh, the fact that uh, the quarterly developments uh, are likely to be more dynamic uh, over the course of the year. And as you can see, our forecast, uh, our projection is that uh, from the second quarter we see pickup, uh, which will become uh, somewhat uh, stronger from uh, the third and uh, fourth quarters uh, of uh, 2013. As the recovery begins to take hold more firmly in 2014, growth in the European economy should amount to around 1.5%, 1.6% in the EU, 1.4% in the euro area. Inflation is expected to fall to below 2% this year and decline further to 1.5% next year. The major risk to the forecast would be to lower our guard on the necessary reforms to bring back growth and job creation. How about public finances then, which is the core business of most of you? Europe has made progress with the necessary fiscal consolidation, which you can see on this slide. For last year, 2012, we expect uh, the headline deficit uh, to have declined uh, to 3.8 percent in the European Union and 3.5 uh, percent in the euro area. In the euro area, this reflects uh, a fiscal consolidation effort of about uh, one and a half percent of uh, GDP on average. Given the progress made uh, on the basis of uh, 2013 budgets, uh, we expect uh, further measures of about uh, three quarters of uh, GDP. So the pace of consolidation is about uh, half uh, this year compared uh, to last year, three quarters instead of uh, one and a half percent of uh, GDP on, uh, on average. And uh, this should bring the deficit uh, below three percent of uh, GDP this year in the euro area and uh, soon also in the rest of uh, the European Union. You can also see that uh, the government uh, debt uh, is reaching 90 percent uh, in uh, the euro area this year, next year, and uh, that is uh, of course uh, a worrying development even though our projection is, projection is that uh, it will stabilize uh, at this level of uh, 90 percent. Then the Worst news uh, comes from the labour market situation, because that's where you see the time lag of, uh, of uh, improving economic conditions. Uh, we have uh, normally first uh, an improving investor confidence, uh, then we have uh, improving growth, and then only improving employment. Uh, and uh, this uh, slide uh, shows that uh, unemployment, uh, the unemployment rate in the EU has uh, climbed uh, to 10.5 percent, uh, and uh, in the euro area, 11.4 percent. Uh, these figures uh, mask uh, large differences uh, between the member states. Uh, but in any case, uh, these figures uh, underline the necessity to combat uh, youth unemployment uh, and intensify active labour market policy. And the Commission is uh, a close partner of uh, EU member states uh, in this uh, effort. So what does this uh, forecast uh, essentially tell us uh, if you look at uh, 
the European economy from a more medium-term perspective backwards and uh, forwards. Uh, it reflects uh, the large uh, adjustment uh, challenges uh, that uh, some member states uh, are still facing despite uh, the progress uh, made. The process of uh, rebalancing of uh, the European economy after the credit fueled uh, boom has uh, made headway and uh, is underway, but uh, it will continue to weigh on growth uh, and uh, public finances uh, still for some time especially in the highly indebted and more vulnerable countries. But this rebalancing is underway, that's important, that's been going underway in this country since 2008, in many other countries since the beginning of 2010, when the debt crisis hit Europe with full force. And it will take still some time before the the large and uh, unsustainable macroeconomic imbalances uh, that accumulated in the first decade of uh, the euro will be uh, completely uh, overcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the forecast uh, makes it clear that uh, the work is not finished uh, yet. Uh, we have uh, major challenges uh, ahead of us, uh, especially unemployment uh, and uh, stronger recovery. And therefore, the debate on the future of uh, economic and monetary union can not be limited uh, to institutional issues uh, only, but we must uh, focus on uh, sustainable growth, uh, job creation, and on the competitiveness of uh, European industry, how to save the industrial base of Europe, uh, at least uh, with the same vigor and uh, energy as we approach uh, the institutional issues. We face uh, three overarching challenges, uh, which were part and parcel of uh, the annual growth survey we presented uh, in the end of last year, which uh, is uh, the basis of uh, the work uh, for the European semester, which is currently underway and uh, where you play a key role. First, uh, we need to find a solution to the challenge of uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation Second, uh, we need to continue with uh, the ongoing efforts uh, to meet the challenge of uh, fiscal sustainability. And uh, third, uh, we have to meet uh, the challenge of uh, rebuilding the economic and uh, monetary union. The first challenge, uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation, calls uh, for us uh, to reverse the trend of uh, European losses uh, in global competitiveness. Most of all, Europe needs uh, more entrepreneurs and businesses that are hungry and able, both hungry and able to grow and create prosperity, create jobs in the European economy. This implies tackling the bottlenecks to growth by creating an entrepreneur-friendly business environment with better access to finance and more efficient business administration. We need to focus also on boosting productive investment, both public and private, as the credit conditions in the private banking sector are not yet normalized. Public banks, such as the European Investment Bank, have an important role to play here. And the capital increase of the EIB and its lending capacity agreed uh, in the end of last year by the member states uh, is a very concrete uh, example of this, uh, this uh, 10, per, 10 billion increase of uh, the capital of the EIB will facilitate uh, 60 billion euros of uh, lending and according to the normal co-financing rates uh, it's uh, expected to stimulate uh, altogether 180 billion euros uh, of uh, investment uh, in uh, innovation and uh, infrastructure in uh, Europe. And this is not only theory, this is already practice uh, because this is uh, part and parcel of the lending mandate uh, of the EIB as of uh, January this year. So it is uh, a work in progress uh, already now. At the same time, uh, we must not forget that uh, private investment uh, is the prime driver of uh, growth. Uh, to unblock uh, private investment, uh, we must complete uh, the repair of the financial sector to restore the flow of credit uh, to households and uh, enterprises. Uh, and, uh, dear friends, uh, it's not about uh, bailing out uh, bankers. Uh, it is about uh, 
letting the credit flow and uh, create uh, growth and uh, jobs. Uh, <coughs> public and private uh, investment uh, is not uh, contradictory. Both are indeed uh, crucial to restore growth uh, in the European economy. We must also look uh, beyond our borders for growth uh, by embracing a forward-looking and uh, proactive trade policy. In Europe, uh, about uh, 30 million jobs, uh, or more than 10 percent of uh, the total workforce, uh, directly depend on sales uh, to the rest of the world, uh, with, uh, of course, uh, strong uh, impact uh, to the rest of the economy and uh, job creation. The decision uh, the other week uh, by the European Union and the United States uh, to initiate uh, negotiations uh, on uh, a groundbreaking, comprehensive and uh, deep uh, free trade agreement uh, is of uh, enormous uh, growth potential in this, this respect uh, for Europe. Successfully facing the challenge of uh, sustainable growth uh, is indeed uh, critical, it is uh, essential if we are to raise uh, our living standards uh, and service the debts uh, that we hand down to future generations. With the future in mind, uh, growth must indeed be sustainable, not only in economic terms, uh, but also in terms of its uh, impact on the environment and uh, climate. Uh, and that's why green growth uh, has uh, great potential both in environmental and uh, economic terms uh, and uh, should remain a top priority in the EU. The second challenge, uh, fiscal sustainability, calls for staying the course of reform and uh, consistent uh, fiscal consolidation. I'm fully aware that uh, there has been uh, a lively and intensive debate, debate on this matter in uh, most, of, most parts of uh, Europe uh, with uh, different uh, angles and uh, different, uh, sometimes uh, different uh, uh, conclusions. Public debt uh, in the European Union has risen from around 60% uh, of uh, GDP before the crisis five years ago to around 90% uh, of uh, GDP uh, today. And on the basis of uh, serious uh, and empirical economic uh, research, uh, I'm referring, for instance, to Carmen Reinhardt and uh, Kenneth Rogoff, uh, the, the sequel to the book, uh, This Time It's Different, uh, sequel in 2011, the study, study on public debt. We know that uh, when public debt uh, rises above 90 uh, percent, it uh, tends to have uh, a negative impact uh, on economic dynamism, which translates uh, into low growth uh, for many years. Nevertheless, uh, as I said, uh, in the context of uh, our economic forecast, uh, the public finances uh, in Europe uh, are gradually improving not with uh, a hasty speed, uh, we still have deficit of 3.5% uh, uh, last year, almost 4% almost uh, in uh, the European Union as a whole. But uh, it is, uh, they are improving thanks to, on the one hand, uh, the enhanced uh, EU economic uh, governance, uh, and on the other hand, uh, determined efforts by governments and uh, parliaments uh, or the member states uh, and this is mirrored uh, by an increase uh, in markets' confidence uh, in the actions uh, being taken by EU governments. The situation does, uh, however, vary substantially among uh, EU member states, uh, and that's why we apply a differentiated approach uh, to consolidation, taking into account uh, the specific challenges of uh, each and every member state uh, when determining the structural fiscal effort uh, needed uh, for every EU member state. This means, uh, in other words, that uh, if growth uh, deteriorates uh, in an unexpected manner, a country may receive uh, additional time to correct its uh, excessive deficit uh, on the condition that uh, it has uh, first uh, delivered uh, the agreed uh, structural fiscal effort uh, and second, second uh, does the necessary structural reforms to underpin uh, medium-term stability and uh, growth. And this, uh, dear friends, uh, was my message and uh, the policy advice of uh, the Commission to several member states uh, in the context of the winter forecast uh, on Friday, which is uh, 
a core part of uh, our reno renewed and uh, reinforced uh, economic uh, governance uh, and a core part of uh, the European semester as well. And finally, our third challenge uh, is uh, rebuilding the economic and uh, monetary union. In fact, uh, in this regard, uh, much has been done already. And uh, as you well know, the uh, economic and uh, budgetary surveillance uh, has been integrated uh, into the European semester. Surveillance is uh, undertaken in a coherent uh, setup uh, over the first uh, six months of each calendar year, allowing all member states uh, to take uh, country specific uh, policy advice uh, into account uh, in their national budgetary processes uh, over the next uh, six months, uh, i.e., before next year's uh, uh, national budget. The adoption of uh, the package of uh, six uh, legislative acts, uh, known as the Six Pack, uh, in 2011, took this uh, further. It strengthened uh, budgetary surveillance uh, and also introduced uh, the macroeconomic uh, imbalances uh, procedure to prevent uh, and uh, correct uh, macroeconomic uh, imbalances. And I can inform you, I have a great chance to inform you on this. Uh, I use this chance. Uh, in other words, uh, in March, uh, we will present uh, our in-depth uh, reviews uh, for around a dozen member states, uh, in which cases uh, we found uh, that uh, there are likely to be excessive uh, macroeconomic uh, imbalances and uh, divergences uh, in competitiveness. Uh, and we will, in that context, uh, provide uh, our views uh, as regards uh, how to address uh, these uh, macroeconomic uh, imbalances. This uh, overhaul has made uh, the Eurozone and uh, EMU much more robust uh, and uh, sturdy than it was uh, at the onset of the crisis. Uh, the crisis has clearly demonstrated uh, how much uh, the economic interdependence, uh, e economic and monetary inter interdependence of our economies has increased uh, since the foundation of uh, the EMU. And that's why we build on uh, this, uh, this work that has been done already to reinforce economic governance, uh, and we suggest uh, steps uh, to move forward. Last November, the Commission put forward uh, a blueprint uh, which presents uh, the economic rationale to bring about uh, the completion of uh, EMU and outlines a roadmap uh, with uh, short, medium and long-term actions uh, to that effect. Uh, it aims at uh, balancing both uh, increased responsibility with uh, increased uh, solidarity, which we see as uh, both uh, part and parcel and essential building blocks of uh, the future EMU. It also indicates uh, the possible need uh, for treaty changes uh, as far as uh, deeper economic and political integration is uh, concerned. Throughout uh, the measures uh, proposed, uh, ensuring democratic uh, legitimacy is uh, at centre stage. Uh, as representatives of uh, national parliaments uh, and uh, European Parliament, you all know very well that uh, parliaments uh, are the places where legitimacy and uh, accountability of uh, policy decisions vis-à-vis uh, -vis the citizen are realised. I know it as a former member of uh, a national parliament and of, of the European Parliament uh, that that's the place uh, and uh, it is you, it is to you that uh, citizens uh, turn for answers uh, and uh, this great responsibility requires uh, finding the best ways and means uh, to move forward uh, through an open debate uh, and uh, discuss. The blueprint uh, builds on the community method uh, by allowing uh, non-euro area participation in uh, the new arrangements uh, wherever possible. It also ensures uh, convergence uh, between uh, the current and uh, future euro area member states. For the short term, from 6 to 18 months, uh, we envisage uh, proposals uh, within the current treaties, uh, starting with the banking union, which is uh, underway. The agreement on the single supervisory mechanism reached in December was an important step in this regard. Next, we will develop a European resolution mechanism. 
and in parallel we will come up with, with proposals uh, for increased uh, prior or ex ante coordination of uh, major economic uh, reforms. We will also need to strengthen economic policy coordination and uh, secure stronger ownership of reforms uh, through contractual arrangements uh, aiming to facilitate uh, the implementation of uh, structural reforms. Uh, they will uh, define uh, the more detailed measures uh, to which uh, the member states uh, commit themselves uh, and uh, to which uh, they can uh, expect uh, financial support uh, from uh, a Eurozone solidarity mechanism. In the medium term, uh, that's uh, from one and a half uh, to five years, uh, we envisage uh, further integration involving treaty changes. Uh, our guiding principle in uh, rebuilding the EMU is that uh, any step uh, towards uh, increased uh, solidarity and uh, mutualization of risk uh, would have to be combined uh, with uh, increased uh, responsibility that is uh, with uh, a further sharing of uh, budgetary sovereignty and uh, deeper integration of uh, decision making especially in the eurozone so chairman uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen uh, let me conclude uh, the challenges uh, ahead of us uh, will not be resolved uh, without uh, hard work uh, and uh, without uh, serious uh, political efforts uh, there is uh, no time for complacency. In the end, uh, what we want to achieve uh, with all of this uh, is a competitive and uh, inclusive economy capable of uh, sustainable growth and uh, high level of uh, job creation while maintaining our European social model and ensuring a sustained uh, rise in welfare. But uh, this requires uh, such an institutional setup uh, that supports uh, these uh, policy objectives. Uh, that's why rebuilding the Economic and Monetary Union is indeed uh, essential for our long term welfare and uh, for the sake of uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Commissioner Wren. And just to remind uh, members and colleagues this morning that it's the green form for session one if you wish to make your intervention and ask your question. So with that said, I'd now like to welcome to the podium Mr. Michael Noonan, TD, Minister for Finance. Minister. Uh, Chairman, Karen Lynch. Uh, chairpersons of the relevant European Parliament committees and chairpersons of the sovereign parliamentary committees. Uh, you're all very welcome here, so good morning everybody. I'm happy to be here for this session on the future of economic and monetary union in the European Union. This is an important topic during Ireland's presidency and I look forward to the discussions and the debate. I want to thank Commissioner Wren not only for his clear words just now, but also for the good work that the Commission has been doing over the last few years in relation to the challenges facing uh, the European, uh, the Economic and Monetary Union. The economic and financial crisis has demonstrated that the architecture of the Economic and Monetary Union is not perfect. Cracks in the system became all too painfully obvious when it was tested by the enormous strains of recent times. And over the coming years, the Union will have to develop the ways and means of strengthening and underpinning of our shared currency. The last few years have made it, made it crystal clear that stability and well-being of the Euro area and the entire European Union are inextricably linked to the stability and well-being of our currency. Weakness and instability and uncertainty surrounding our common currency have, been, have had a markedly negative impact upon member states. It has been, become increasingly clear that the euro needs to be grounded on the foundations of a strengthened economic and monetary union. Together with President Van Rompuy and the valuable input of the Commission, we are in the process of carefully assessing what needs to be done. Only then will we move to determining how best to take those steps forward. 
It is critically important that we get this right. EMU is a core project of the European Union, and if these reforms do not succeed, the EU itself may not endure. I do not propose going into the detail of the history of the development of the Economic and Monetary Union. However, I would like to draw some conclusions on what we can learn from the past, even from the very recent past. Before the crisis, there seemed to be a fairly clear structure with respect to economic governance within the EU. The central bank was responsible for monetary policy, and the governments of the member states were responsible for economic policy, including fiscal policy. The treaties established a loose framework seeking to ensure national fiscal discipline and the coordination of economic policy more generally for all members of the European Union. Although Eurozone governments recognized that national economic policy had an impact on economies of the member states, it is evident that they did not appreciate the, stre the strength of these feedback loops and the ultimate effect on their own economies. The Stability and Growth Pact then was the main instrument for coordination of member states' national fiscal policies in the EMU. But regrettably, it was not enforced consistently, and uh, some of the transgressors were uh, the bigger states and the strongest economies in the Union. Furthermore, the system of economic governance did not give adequate regard to preventing large fiscal and economic imbalances building up in individual member states. And not only that, but essential structural reforms were postponed in a period of growth for many member states, resulting in weaknesses uh, which now need to be addressed. The EU has often been criticised for its slow response to the crisis in terms of introducing improved economic governance measures. In my opinion, this is an unfair criticism. The scale and depth of the crisis was unprecedented and required remedies that would have been practically inconceivable at other times. In terms of institutional reform, we have a European Union of 27 member states, soon to be 28. In addition, we cannot forget the role of the European Parliament in the governance process of the Union. Change has to be agreed. It cannot be imposed, and implementation takes time. If we see that reforms are needed, we all want to have them implemented swiftly. We want a quick overall solution. However, the changes that have been adopted have political consequences for all member states, both long-term and often immediate. And, po and po political and public agreement of them is absolutely essential. There is a crucial job to be done by all ministers to convince their citizens of the need for change. For example, we have to have external oversight of their budgetary process, where none may have existed previously. These are important and, for many countries, difficult changes, and they need to be recognised as such. So, contrary to the criticism of many, Europe is acting across a number of fronts in response to the crisis. We have set up the ESF, the EFSF and its success of the ESM to help member states in difficulty. There have also been various important and targeted interventions by the European Central Bank. And we need to deliver on what has already been committed to break the vicious circle between banking and sovereign debt. Our focus continues to be on delivering what was agreed by the heads of state and government, including the decision made on the 29th of June 2012. These commitments are vital in giving certainty to the markets and are important to the credibility of Europe as a whole. As I have already briefly touched on, the previous economic governance system was inadequate in that it was too narrow in its scope and did not lead to the identification of emerging problems and imbalances in time to head off the crisis and reduce its effects. It is only when we look to the governance structures that were in place before the crisis that we can see how much has been achieved, particularly in the past 18 months. 
The EU and its member states have taken a series of important decisions that will strengthen economic and budgetary coordination for the European Union as a whole, and for the euro area in particular. These reforms have been multifaceted in nature. The main reform process began uh, with EU uh, 2020 and EU's growth strategy for the decade, which aims to make the EU a smart, sustainable and inclusive economy. This was followed by the European Semester, to which was added the Euro Plus Pact and the so-called Six Pact Pact, which came into effect on the 13th of December uh, 2011. The effectiveness of the Six Pack has also been bolstered by the Fiscal Compact, which requires contracting parties to ensure convergence towards the country-specific medium-term objective, as, decide, as defined in the Stability and Growth Pact. The Two Pack, on which political agreement was secured by the Irish Presidency last week, is a significant and welcome further enhancement of the economic governance architecture for Euro area member states and uh, is in many respects a natural extension of the six pack. Agreement in this dossier has been a priority for the Irish Presidency following the mandate from the December European Council which called for the rapid, rapid adoption of the measure. The agreement will now go forward for formal approval uh, by Member States Ambassadors and the regulations will subsequently be formally agreed by the European Parliament and the Council before being adopted by Member States. Effective management of the European semester is also an important element of the Irish Presidency and our implementation of the Presidency Roadmap for the 2013 semester will help us to ensure that the process will be both effective and efficient. Perhaps the greatest development in response to the economic and financial crisis has been the move towards banking union. We need effective banking supervision at the level of the Eurozone and the European Union. We need deposit insurance and we need a bank resolution scheme at a European level. We need agreement on the Capital Requirements Directive, the so-called CRD4. The Irish Presidency is giving absolute priority to all files relating to the promotion of the banking union, along the lines of the priorities outlined by the European Council. The first real step to a European banking union to break the link between sovereign and banks was in December when finance ministers reached an important agreement on the creation of a single supervisory mechanism. This is a, a major step towards ensuring financial stability and thus facilitating growth. Political agreement now needs to be reached with the European Parliament so that the overall agreement can come into force. This is being pursued vigorously by the Irish Presidency. We are also working hard to ensure that the remaining next pillars, Capital Requirements Directive, uh, that's the CRD4, and harmonised resolution and deposit guarantee schemes are put in place as soon as possible. Proposals for a single resolution mechanism are uh, also to be developed by the Commission. Once full banking union is in place, the direct link between the sovereign and the banking system should be fully broken thus ensuring a more stable euro area in the future. But this is one important element of a wider effort. The four presidents' paper of December, entitled towards a genuine economic and monetary union, has laid out four areas of necessary progress. More integration in our financial, budgetary and economic policy frameworks and enhanced democratic legitimacy and accountability. Thoughts on the way forward were also helped greatly by the Commission's blueprint, which was published around the same time. I very much welcome the respective contributions of President Van Rompuy and the Commission on the next steps in relation to strengthening uh, economic and monetary union. As agreed by heads of state and government at the European Council in December, a number of issues of deeper integration of the EMU, including ex-ante policy coordination and the idea of contractual arrangements, will be further examined at the June European Council. These are wide-ranging and complex issues, and I welcome President Van Rompuy's efforts to make the process as transparent as possible. 
Discussions at national level have just started on these issues, and specific proposals are still to be tabled. Many member states have yet to develop a formal position. At recent Council meetings, views appeared to converge more on the issue of ex-ende coordination, while more uncertainty and diverging views were noted on the issue of mutually agreed contracts, and even more so on solidarity mechanisms. The contractual commitments proposed will warrant further consideration. These ideas need to be examined so we can be clear on what might be involved. They raise many questions and complex issues, but yet they may ultimately have a contribution to make. Before I conclude, I would like to comment on the proposals on economic and monetary union on the enhancement of democratic legitimacy as part of the process. As a parliamentarian, I believe that we need to strengthen our institutions at European level, that we ensure that uh, they do not become more remote from our citizens. In fact, the opposite must be the case. In Ireland, we have direct experience of the risks of people feeling disconnected from decision-making at a European level. There is, of course, between, there is, of course a, a tension between acting quickly and decisively and engaging in wide, open-ended consultation. But democratic legitimacy and accountability cannot be an afterthought. They are part of our shared European values but they are also a crucial underpinning of the long-term stability of the whole system. Any agreed changes require democratic debate and agreement. The role of our Parliament and the European Parliament is central to this debate. The Irish Presidency will continue to work closely with President Van Rompuy as he explores options for the further evolution of EMU one that offers a suitable response to the great challenges that we face. The process leading up to the June European Council presents us with an opportunity to take stock of the important progress we have made in recent months and to outline a vision for a prosperous future for the European Union. A strengthened economic and monetary union is critical to the stability and well-being of the euro area and indeed the entire European Union. We have been tested and the pressures brought to bear on EMU have been almost unprecedented. But do not doubt for one second that our economic and monetary union uh, will not emerge stronger, clearer and more sustainable from the crisis. The challenge now for European leaders is to put in place the policies we have already agreed upon and those that are still urgently needed to ensure that the confidence which has returned in the euro area will remain uh, well into the future and to put all member states large and small on a stable trajectory towards growth and prosperity in a closer more solid more balanced union and we as presidency uh, will be in the forefront of these efforts i'd like to thank you very much today This morning's session. Uh, I'll be taking questionnaires and contributions in batches of five and colleagues are free to make either a contribution, make a comment, make a statement or ask a question but regardless of what they choose they will be limited to two minutes in that approach. So if your priority is to ask a question and you spend your time commenting and then expect a question that won't be facilitated you will have two minutes specifically to make a contribution. So with that said the first person I'd like to call in this morning, the first contributor, is Monsieur Philippe Marini from France. Monsieur Marini. Two Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chairman. Et je me réjouis de cette réunion comme des réunions précédentes organisées entre parlementaires nationaux. At this meeting, as uh, I was at the previous meeting of members of the national parliaments, the TSG moi, in uh, Article Parlement Nationaux. 15, foresees a certain association of national parliaments 
What I would like from the Presidency of the Council and from the Commission and European Parliament is that this association of the national parliaments be organized in a very a specific fashion, as we're now doing here today, on the basis of subjects so to structure our discussion. And I would like to make a proposal the OECD is doing the sharing or shifting. Et me semble nécessiter des échanges entre parlementaires nationaux. Ceci en vue de comprendre et en vue de prévoir, so lorsque l'on évoque le besoin d'une intégration Pour euh, être très concret, so, je propose specific, que propose dans de futurs échanges au cours du semestre irlandais, on veuille bien traiter de cette question spécifique should, uh, entre parlementaires nationaux. Est-ce que demain ou après-demain, euh, l'impôt sur les sociétés disparaîtra de nos finances publiques <clears throat> Should we keep a part and which part and how can we see to it that our fellow citizens be better involved in the choice of fiscal policies? Merci, President. Uh, Monsieur le, le commissaire, je voudrais euh, apporter une dimension supplémentaire et m'inquiéter. Uh, 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 climate challenges, uh, work in terms of the world economy, and look after the needs of the poor. Now, of course, we have to have flexibility given the different situations in the different countries. You also have to have a capacity to invest in the economy of the future, in research and development, in training, uh, training workers, uh, energy issues, and this a fiscal consolidation that uh, we're seeing now means that uh, we can't necessarily make progress on all of that. Also, social progress when it comes to the union and also combating poverty. We have to think about the whole generation being sacrificed. The chairman talked in his introduction about uh, the phenomenon of youth unemployment. We think we have to preserve social models and get the social partners involved in a democratic manner in the whole discussion. Now, when it comes to banking, uh, we talk about uh, banking supervision, and we have to regulate the banking sector and reform the banks, because in our countries, as in others, there's a form of credit crunch, so it's impossible for businesses to get financing, because uh, banks prefer the financial markets to the real economy. Now, I'd also like to talk about fiscal uh, uh, coherence between our member states. They're in competition with one another, and so they're trying to uh, get uh, uh, companies set up. And then I would finish by talking about uh, revenue, uh, for example, the financial transaction tax. Um, then you talked about exports, but we're also uh, the victims of imports, which are taking place uh, on the basis basis of a social and environmental criteria which is less ideal than our own. So how can we protect ourselves from that too? So how can we, we have to do all these things, but there also has to be hope
hope that it will be possible to invest in the economy of the future, not only in green growth, but also in um, um, energy production, energy capacities, which might then lead in turn to the creation of uh, uh, large numbers of jobs. Minister, first of all, the economic and social models in, you, in the EU are challenged by the economic and financial crisis. The question is the role of the state. The state will not be able, from my uh, conviction, to stop the structural change. Therefore, we should concentrate to use our money to try to influence the structural change. We have the demographic change, we have markets which are saturated, we have the climate change, and we have a lack of innovation and a technology gap. And we have a political dilemma. Citizens uh, turn in crisis back to national approaches, uh, but we lack of institutional integration in the EU. We learned that a common currency needs an institution securing common interests. And therefore, I would like to uh, put some questions. Where do